Let's start with the most explosive number, 2,821,364. That's the death toll explicitly attributed to God's direct actions in the Bible. Think about that for a second. We're not talking about wars, famines, or natural disasters. These are divine commands, deliberate decisions from the God of the Bible, carried out with precision. If this number feels shocking, it should. But here's the thing, this number doesn't even account for the implicit deaths, the massive floods, the destruction of entire cities, or the plagues with no clear tally. This figure is based on stories where the body count is written in black and white. Now, does this challenge what you were taught about God? Maybe. For most of us, the image we've been given is of a loving, merciful creator. But here, we have an all-powerful being directly responsible for nearly 3 million deaths. This isn't just Old Testament God stuff either. These are stories deeply woven into the biblical narrative from the very beginning to the end. And it forces us to confront a tough question, how do we reconcile a God who orders mass killings with the idea of a loving, benevolent deity? Let's break it down. We know the big numbers, but the individual stories are even more unsettling. You want evidence? Look no further than the very first killing ordered by God, the Great Flood. It's not just a children's story with animals on a boat, it's divine mass extinction. Every human being, every animal, every living thing, gone, except for one family. That's one hell of a reset button. And yet, it's right there in Genesis, unapologetic. What kind of judgment justifies that? And that's just the beginning. Fast forward through the Bible, and you get Sodom and Gomorrah, Egypt's firstborn sons, Korah's rebellion where the earth literally swallows people alive, events that are not metaphors, but described as acts of divine wrath. These aren't acts of a distant deity or nature's random cruelty. These are decisions, orders. The chilling reality is that God, according to the Bible, doesn't hesitate when it comes to wiping out his enemies, or even his own people when they fall out of line. The flood wiped out humanity. Cities were obliterated. Armies were decimated. What's fascinating is how these stories are often glossed over, treated as minor notes in the larger biblical symphony. But when you start stacking the numbers, it becomes impossible to ignore the body count. These stories don't just paint God as a creator but as a judge, executioner, and sometimes even a destroyer. Do we accept that these killings were justified because, well, he's God? Or do we dare to question? Are we, perhaps, seeing a reflection of human fear and control and need to justify the harshest of punishments with divine authority? These are questions that have rattled theologians for centuries and still provoke strong reactions today. Here's the twist, people still worship this God. These stories are part of the same text that teaches love and mercy. It's this tension that makes the Bible so gripping, so controversial. God's kill count isn't just a shocking statistic, it's a mirror to how we understand power, morality, and justice. And when you dig into the numbers, you realize the Bible's message isn't as clear-cut as you might think. It's complicated. It's brutal. And it forces you to confront the most unsettling question, what kind of God does this? Here's where things really start to heat up. The story of Noah's Ark is often presented like a cute children's tale. You know the one, two of every animal boarding a boat, the rain pouring down, and then the rainbow at the end, signaling a fresh start. But strip away the nursery decorations, and what you're left with is one of the most brutal acts of mass genocide ever recorded. Let's be crystal clear here, this wasn't just a heavy storm. According to Genesis, God wiped out every single human being on earth, sparing only one family. And not just humans. Every bird, every beast, every creeping thing. All gone, submerged under the weight of divine judgment. For what? Corruption. Violence. The Bible says, the earth was filled with violence, Genesis 6 verse 11. But even then, does that justify exterminating every living creature? No specific number is given in the text, but scholars have tried to estimate the population of the ancient world at the time. We're talking millions, if not billions. Entire cities, civilizations, families, all lost beneath the waves. 
This is no small-scale event. It's a cataclysm, a cosmic reset. And it wasn't just a snap of the fingers. God made a point to warn Noah, gave him precise instructions, and waited while the world continued its downward spiral. He watched it happen, step by step, before finally pulling the trigger on humanity's destruction. Noah and his family survive, but think about what that survival must have felt like. You're adrift in a boat for over a year, knowing that every single person you've ever known is dead. Their homes, their crops, their animals, everything, gone. There's no gradual demise, no series of unfortunate accidents. This was God hitting a hard reset on the entire world. And here's the thing that gets people, the Bible frames this as a good thing as a necessary act to cleanse the earth. The flood was punishment, yes, but also purification. The Bible says God regretted creating humanity because of how corrupt they had become. But does regret really warrant the death of millions? What's the moral calculus here? Is God bound by a different set of rules? Or is this an example of divine overreach and excessive punishment for human failure? What makes this even more unsettling is that Noah's Ark is often portrayed as an act of mercy. God could have wiped out everyone, but he chose to save Noah. But let's be honest, it's hard to see mercy when you're standing on top of the bodies of millions. And for what? The world didn't exactly get better afterward, did it? Humanity, as we know, goes right back to its wicked ways after the flood, leading to more divine interventions down the line. So, was the flood a success? Or a colossal failure in managing creation? And if that doesn't make you question, think about this, was there no other option? Couldn't God have reformed humanity instead of erasing it? Could there have been some other way to deal with corruption and violence? Or was annihilation the only choice? Some argue this is a case of divine justice, where God is allowed to act in ways that we, as humans, cannot understand. Others see it as a reflection of an ancient worldview, where destruction was seen as the only solution to corruption. But either way, the story forces you to confront the reality that God chose to kill everyone, and the consequences of that decision still echo today. Now, if you thought the flood was bad, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah takes divine judgment to an entirely different level. Two cities, wiped off the map. Not by water this time, but by fire and brimstone. God literally rains down destruction from the sky, burning everything and everyone in sight. Men, women, children, animals, obliterated. And why? For sin. The Bible gives us a clear reason the wickedness of these cities had reached its breaking point. Their reputation for moral corruption and depravity was so infamous that not even ten righteous people could be found within their walls. That's all it would have taken, just ten righteous people to spare these cities. But there weren't any. So, God decided they had to go. Now, here's where things get even darker. The scene is set in Genesis 19. God sends two angels to Sodom to warn Lot, Abraham's nephew, to get out before the city is destroyed. The people of Sodom, however, aren't exactly welcoming. In fact, they try to assault the angels, which seems to be the final straw. Lot and his family flee, and the cities are reduced to smoldering ash, as if they never even existed. There are two important things to grapple with here. First, we don't have exact numbers, but based on historical and archaeological estimates, the population of these cities could have ranged from a few thousand to tens of thousands. That's a significant death toll for a targeted, precise act of divine destruction. No negotiation, no redemption, just pure judgment. God didn't just destroy the guilty. Everyone in those cities went down, innocent children, babies, people who might not have had any part in the city's sins. They were all caught in the divine crossfire. Is this an example of collective punishment? Could some have been spared? It raises the difficult question, where's the line between justice and cruelty? Is there such a thing as overkill in divine terms? What's more, this wasn't the last time Sodom and Gomorrah were brought up in Scripture. They're mentioned throughout the Bible as the ultimate example of God's wrath and what happens to societies that fall too far into sin. It's almost like a warning sign, step out of line, 
and this is what could happen to you. But is that fair? Should entire populations be obliterated for the actions of some? And let's not forget Lot's wife. She's fleeing with her family, but she dares to look back at the destruction, and what happens? She turns into a pillar of salt. Just like that, for a simple glance, she's gone. Was her curiosity really deserving of that kind of punishment? Or is this another example of how uncompromising divine judgment can be? This is one of those stories that forces you to wrestle with the idea of God's morality. Is this justice in its purest form? Or does this level of annihilation reveal something far more complex and possibly troubling about the way God operates in the biblical narrative? Some theologians defend this as a necessary act of purging evil from the earth. Others point to it as an example of ancient societies trying to explain the destruction of cities in a way that made sense to them by attributing it to divine anger. But either way, Sodom and Gomorrah remain one of the most shocking and controversial examples of divine punishment in the entire Bible. Now, we get into one of the most heart-wrenching and brutal stories in the Bible, the killing of Egypt's firstborn. If there's one event that demonstrates the sheer, unforgiving force of God's wrath, it's this one. We're talking about the tenth and final plague in the showdown between God and Pharaoh. And this one? It's personal. Picture this, Egypt is in chaos. Nine plagues have already torn through the land, boils, frogs, locusts, rivers of blood. But Pharaoh is still refusing to let the Israelites go. Then, God ups the ante. The message is clear, release my people, or your firstborn sons will die. Pharaoh doesn't listen, and that night, death sweeps through Egypt. This isn't just a vague act of God with no visible consequences. This is an intentional, direct strike. At midnight, the Bible says, God passed through Egypt, and every firstborn son in the land, from Pharaoh's palace to the prisoner's cell, was killed. Even the firstborn of the livestock weren't spared. Can you even grasp the scale of that? Entire families waking up to find their sons, their future, their hope, gone. And it wasn't just the rich or powerful who suffered. No, this plague hit everyone. The Bible records the sound of wailing across Egypt, a cry that had never been heard before and would never be heard again. We're talking about thousands, maybe tens of thousands, of firstborn sons dead in one night. There's no real estimate for how many lives were taken, but Egypt was a major civilization at the time, so the number could easily have been in the tens of thousands. And this wasn't some far-off battlefield. This happened in the homes of everyday people, parents finding their children dead in their beds. This was God's plan. A deliberate, calculated move to break Pharaoh's will. And it worked. Pharaoh, broken by the loss of his own firstborn, finally ordered the Israelites to leave. The question, though, is at what cost? Was the death of so many innocent children truly necessary to free the Israelites? Couldn't there have been another way? These are the kinds of moral dilemmas that make you stop and think. We're not talking about hardened warriors or corrupt leaders being punished. These were children. God's people, the Israelites, were spared, thanks to the mark of lamb's blood over their doors. But that raises another difficult question, was this really about justice, or was it about power? God could have used any number of methods to free his people, yet he chose this one. Why target children? Is this an example of divine justice being so far beyond human understanding that we can't even comprehend it? Or is this a clear case of divine overkill? It's a haunting story. God wasn't just flexing power, he was making a point. But it's a point that leaves a trail of innocent blood behind it. Some argue that this was God's way of showing that he wasn't just the God of the Israelites, but the God of the entire world, including Egypt. Others see it as a terrifying demonstration of what happens when you go up against divine will. This story might not get as much attention as the flood or the plagues, but it's just as shocking and perhaps even more unsettling when you think about the details. Korah's rebellion is a straight-up tale of defiance, judgment, and a terrifying display of divine power. We're talking about God opening up the earth to swallow people alive. Yes, you heard that right, alive. Korah, a Levite, 
wasn't happy with Moses and Aaron's leadership. He wasn't alone, 250 community leaders joined him in challenging their authority. Their argument? Moses and Aaron were no better than the rest of them. Why should they have the exclusive right to lead? They claimed everyone in the community was holy, so why couldn't they share in the leadership roles? Sounds like a classic case of challenging the system, right? But this wasn't just a debate about governance, it was a direct challenge to the authority God had given Moses. And the consequences were nothing short of catastrophic. Moses, acting on God's instructions, told Korah and his followers to bring censers of incense before the Lord as a test of their holiness. But it wasn't long before things took a dark turn. God made it clear that he wasn't having any of this rebellion. What happened next was brutal and swift. In the middle of the standoff, the ground beneath Korah and his followers opened up, swallowing them, their families, and all their possessions whole. Just like that, they were gone, buried alive. The earth literally closed over them. If that wasn't enough, fire from God consumed the 250 men who had joined Korah in his rebellion. This wasn't just a slap on the wrist for questioning authority. This was mass execution on a terrifying scale, delivered in the most dramatic way possible. Let's talk about what that means. We're not just dealing with a handful of people here. 14,700 Israelites died in the aftermath due to a plague sent by God as a further punishment for those who complained about the deaths of Korah and his followers. When you add it all up, this rebellion led to the deaths of over 15,000 people. All for questioning the leadership structure God had put in place. This story doesn't sit comfortably, does it? On one hand, you could argue that Korah and his followers got what was coming to them. They defy God, after all. But on the other hand, does the punishment fit the crime? Were 15,000 deaths really necessary to make the point that God's chosen leaders shouldn't be challenged? And what about the collateral damage? Families swallowed alive, were they guilty by association? The real question is, why such a harsh response? Is God sending a message here that divine authority is not to be questioned under any circumstances? If so, where does that leave us when it comes to free will, dissent, and even the possibility of dialogue with the divine? Is rebellion against divine authority always met with such extreme consequences, or was this just an isolated moment of divine fury? What's even more striking is that the punishment wasn't just directed at the leaders of the rebellion, it extended to the people around them, their families, and the community that dared to complain afterward. The message couldn't be clearer, defy God's chosen leaders, and the consequences will be absolute, swift, and total. There's no room for negotiation or second chances here. Let's dive into one of the most chilling, and frankly, under-discussed, acts of divine judgment in the Bible, the plague sent by God that kill thousands, seemingly out of nowhere. These aren't your standard diseases or natural disasters. These are calculated, targeted acts that make the narrative of God as a warrior judge painfully clear. First up, David's census. Now, this one is wild. In 2 Samuel 24, King David orders a census of the people of Israel and Judah. Harmless, right? Wrong. God saw this act as an act of pride and a lack of trust in his protection. The result? God gives David three punishment options, three years of famine, three months of fleeing from his enemies, or three days of plague. David chooses the plague and the consequence. 70,000 people die. Let that sink in, 70,000 lives, wiped out in three days because of a king's decision to count his population. And here's where it gets even more twisted. Just as the angel of the Lord was about to destroy Jerusalem, God relented, saying, enough. He stopped short of annihilating the entire city, but not before leaving a staggering death toll in his wake. Now, let's unpack that. Was David's census really worth 70,000 lives? What's the deeper message here? Is it about the dangers of pride or something else entirely? God's judgment here is swift and overwhelming, almost like a cosmic balancing act. David's sin, in this case, has a ripple effect that costs thousands of innocent lives. It's not just about David anymore. It's about his people, and they pay the ultimate price. 
Was this really about justice, or was this a case of God making an example out of his chosen king? Either way, the scale of the death toll is terrifying, and it forces you to ask, how does divine judgment work when the punishment seems so far removed from the crime? But let's not stop there. 2 Kings 19 brings us another plague, this time against an invading army. The Assyrians, led by King Sennacherib, are on the verge of conquering Jerusalem. Hezekiah, the king of Judah, prays to God for deliverance. And just like that, the angel of the Lord strikes down 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in a single night. No battle, no warning, just 185,000 dead men, littering the ground by morning. The Assyrian army retreats, defeated without a sword being lifted by the people of Judah. This moment is often hailed as a miracle, a divine intervention that saves Jerusalem from certain destruction. And sure, if you're rooting for Judah, it's a great victory. But if you take a step back, you realize that 185,000 people were just erased. The Bible doesn't give us a detailed explanation for why the entire army had to die, other than they were threatening God's chosen city. But was mass death really the only solution? Couldn't God have found a way to stop the invasion without the overwhelming loss of life? Here's where the tension really builds. On one hand, you have the narrative of God protecting his people, intervening to save them from destruction. But on the other, the sheer body count is staggering. These weren't just faceless enemies, they were people, soldiers, likely conscripted into service, who had families back home. Was their death justified because they were part of the wrong army at the wrong time? Both of these stories, the 70,000 Israelites dead because of a census and the 185,000 Assyrians wiped out in a single night, show us a God who doesn't just sit back and watch the world unfold. He steps in, and when he does, people die. A lot of people. The numbers don't lie, and they force us to confront the uncomfortable truth the God of the Bible doesn't always act in ways that align with modern concepts of justice and morality. Now, if you've made it this far, you've seen a pattern, when God steps in, people die. But it's not random, and it's definitely not accidental. These deaths are deliberate, calculated acts of judgment. And when you step back and look at the bigger picture, you see that it doesn't stop with the Old Testament. No. The story of divine judgment extends all the way to the very end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, where the death toll reaches apocalyptic proportions. Revelation is a prophetic book about the end of the world, and let me tell you, it doesn't hold back. Wars, plagues, famines, earthquakes, you name it, Revelation's got it. And once again, it's God, through his angels, delivering death on an unimaginable scale. This time, though, the target is the entire world. It's not just one nation, one army, or even one rebellious city, it's humanity. Revelation 9 alone mentions a plague of fire, smoke, and sulfur that wipes out a third of mankind. Just think about that for a second. One third of all people. That's billions of lives, erased in the blink of an eye. All at the hand of a God who's decided it's time to wrap things up. And it doesn't end there. There's the Battle of Armageddon, where armies from every corner of the earth gather to fight against God. Spoiler alert, they lose. Spectacularly. Blood runs so deep it's described as reaching the height of a horse's bridle, roughly five feet of blood flowing across the land. Once again, it's not a fight, it's a slaughter. God's enemies, decimated. The rebellious nations? Gone. This is total war, and God's playing by his own rules. So, what are we supposed to take from all of this? It's easy to get caught up in the numbers, the millions of lives lost throughout the Bible, from the flood to the final judgment. But what's really going on here? Is this about justice? Power? Control? Some will argue that these deaths are acts of divine justice, the ultimate balancing of the scales. Sin demands punishment, and God, being just, delivers that punishment swiftly and without hesitation. After all, who better than the Creator to judge His creation? Others, though, can't help but feel a sense of unease at the sheer brutality of it all. If God is truly loving and merciful, why such extreme measures? 
Why so many innocent lives caught in the crossfire? And then there's the question of free will. If humanity is given the freedom to choose, to make mistakes, why is the response to those mistakes so overwhelmingly violent? Are these stories simply a reflection of ancient cultures trying to make sense of their suffering, or are they divine revelations that demand our reverence, no matter how difficult they are to accept? This tension between justice and mercy, between power and compassion, runs through every story we've covered. It's what makes the Bible so endlessly fascinating and endlessly controversial. The God of the Bible is not one-dimensional. He's not just a gentle shepherd. He's a warrior, a judge, a destroyer when he needs to be. And that's a side of God that many people don't like to talk about. It doesn't fit neatly into the idea of a loving, caring deity. But it's there, right in the text, for anyone who's willing to look. Maybe that's the point. Maybe these stories aren't supposed to be easy to digest. Maybe they're meant to provoke, to challenge our understanding of morality, justice, and divine power. Maybe God's judgment is something we're not meant to fully comprehend, but rather, to acknowledge and wrestle with. Because at the end of the day, these stories force us to confront one undeniable truth, God is not bound by our rules. He operates on a level far beyond what we can imagine, and when he acts, it's final. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive into one of the most controversial topics in the Bible. Whether you agree or disagree, I hope this has challenged your thinking and opened your eyes to the complexity of these ancient texts. We don't claim to have all the answers, but we believe asking the hard questions is a vital part of understanding faith and humanity itself. If you found this video interesting, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Share your thoughts below. Do you see God's actions in the Bible as justice or something else? Let's get a conversation going. Thanks again for watching, and as always, God bless us all.